Hello and a very warm welcome to the program from me, David Foster. How do you save creatures that are on the verge of extinction? The United Nations estimates that a quarter of all species could soon be lost, many within decades. Today on Roundtable, working to preserve what can never be replaced. Well, in a couple of minutes, we'll be talking to somebody trying to save the most trafficked mammal on Earth and to two others fighting to slow down what's being called the sixth mass extinction. And we ask, is it already too late? Animals are dying off at the fastest rate since the dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago. More than 500 land-based vertebrates are expected to disappear by 2040. Researchers say the state of decline of these species is much higher than previously thought and warn that the world's sixth mass extinction is already underway. Some of those species at particular risk include the Sumatran rhino, the Clarion Island wren, the Espanola giant tortoise, harlequin frog and most recently pangolins. Pangolin meat is considered a delicacy in China and its scales are used in traditional medicine. They are one of the world's most threatened species, but new efforts are underway to reintroduce pangolins to parts of Africa where the animal has been extinct for decades. Conservationists hope a new method of soft release will make the difference. It happens in two phases, a period of observation before release then intense monitoring after release using GPS and radio tracking. The process of relocating these animals back into the wild has had many setbacks. So what will it take to stop them and other endangered species from going extinct? Well, I'm very pleased to say that we have with us Helena Atkinson. She's in Cape Town and is conservation projects manager at Pangolin, Africa. In Bristol in the UK, Neil Aldridge, conservationist and award-winning photographer, and on the west coast of the US in Portland, Oregon, Tierra Curry, senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity and the director of the Saving Life on Earth campaign. Very good to have all three of you with us. I'm going to come to you first of all, Helena, the, the pangolin, the only mammal uh, with scales, blamed unfairly many say at the moment, perhaps for being part of the coronavirus crisis. But it is endangered. One, I think, is disappearing at the rate of every five minutes. How many do you think there are? How much danger do we have? Well, we don't really know how many pangolins are left in the wild. That's that's part of the deity of the situation is, you know, the last one can be taken from the wild any minute and we might not even notice. So as pangolin conservationists, we are terribly concerned. And in one way, we were quite happy because of the attention pangolins got due to the coronavirus crisis. But um, on the other hand, you know, we don't want people to think they are virus infected animals. You know, they're pretty special mammals. Um, and if you've engaged with one before, you've seen one, um, they really, really steal your heart. They're pretty special. So it's been good and bad that they've been in the news so much. But um, Ultimately, we don't know how many are left. We are very well, we, we, we get, because... Sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, very concerned. We're going to see a little clip from a film called Pangolin Africa towards the end of this programme, showing um, how people are reacting to them when they, when they get close to them. But I wanted to say to you, you don't know how many there, there are. You obviously have a love of a pangolin. Isn't there a case that everybody who has a particular affinity with an animal is going to say this one needs to be saved when in fact it's an impossible thing to do? That might be the case. You know, we have our special animals that we love. But, you know, if pangolins get conserved and saved, um, it saves many great habitats. So it is um, something that will benefit many other animals. And it also says quite a bit about us, you know, if we lose this absolutely defenseless, vulnerable animal, it says a lot about humanity and what we have allowed to happen. 
And we'll talk about how you're managing to protect them in, in just a moment. But do you blame it on crime? Do you blame it on deforestation? Do you blame it on human encroachment? What do you think is the real reason uh, for the disappearance of these creatures? There are a number of reasons, um, mostly because of poaching um, and then, um, you know, traditional medicine use, um, pangolins being eaten as a delicacy, uh, also as a basic source of protein in Africa. Um, habitat loss, of course, is a big reason. And then also something we see in southern Africa um, is that pangolins can often get caught on electric fences. Um, there are a lot of electric fences in southern Africa for game ranches, for livestock farms, private game reserves. And pangolins, the, the one that we find in southern Africa, the Temmings ground pangolin, often actually walk into these fences, curl around it as part of their defense mechanism, and then ultimately succumb due to the electric shocks or due to, um, you know, just being stuck on the fence for a really long time. So there's a number of reasons, but the one that we are fighting the most right now is the poaching. Uh, Neil, I know you've been involved in a number of different projects, and I see behind Helena um, the picture of the wild dogs of Africa. Let's go through a list of some creatures that have been brought back from the brink. Grey wolf, uh, bald eagle, grey whale, sea lion, believe it or not, the Siberian tiger uh, there were only about 40 of those left now there are about 500 plus uh, the american alligator well so many of those in the states and i know because i had a, a brief encounter with one at one stage but they were endangered and a particular favorite of yours neil the white rhinoceros there was just a handful um, in the southern hemisphere now that number has gone up and they've been successfully saved how did that happen well, the, uh, yeah, we were down to about 20 to 50 individuals um, uh, at the lowest point. And when they, they identified the, uh, the, the, those, those final animals, they, they, it was not only about protecting those, uh, those rhinos, but it was also about protecting where they live. And uh, gradually they were able to, uh, to, to see the numbers increase and then importantly start to return uh, rhinos back to areas where they had been lost and unfortunately in the case of the rhinos we've also had uh, several waves of, of, of poaching um, uh, actually sort of decimate their numbers uh, over the course of the last century or so so uh, and we're now in this of the, the really the, the third great uh, war against the rhino um, and it, the white rhino Incredibly, now is up to about eighteen thousand individuals. Which, if you think about coming from twenty to fifty individuals up to eighteen thousand, is a phenomenal uh, success story for. for and that for was done by cracking down on on poaching, mostly, was it? Cracking down on poaching, um, but of course also, like I said, protecting the habitat where they live, and that that, that mm. really has to come first. Making sure there is actually the space for these uh, for these creatures to to live, and that's not just the case with rhinos that's the case with uh with every endangered species um but then breeding those numbers up uh safely watching them increase and then uh then building new viable breeding populations elsewhere and one of the projects i was involved with uh over the last few years has been up in botswana where uh, actually that same model has been has been applied really identifying the uh the okavango delta in northern botswana one of the great wildernesses of our planet uh, as pristine rhino habitat, but actually Botswana had lost all of its rhinos by uh, the early 90s due to hunting and poaching. Um, and due to political will as well and pristine habitat, they were able to successfully return rhinos back to Botswana uh, with great success. Uh, Tierra, let me ask you, and this is something for, for all three of you, but uh, let's bring Tierra into the conversation. The report that made us want to get into this particular program has just come out saying um, extinction possibilities are accelerating at an extraordinary rate. Uh, why do you, Tierra, think that is the case? Well, last year, two groundbreaking reports came out, one from the United Nations saying that a million species are now at risk of extinction, and the other one showing that of all the species that have been assessed, nearly one in four species on the planet is now at risk of extinction. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, growing human population, encroaching on wildlife habitat, and over-exploitation. Humans 
taking too many animals from the wild and using wildlife as a product instead of as plants and animals that we share the planet with and depend on. And so we know that to protect these plants and animals that share earth with us, we need environmental laws and enforcement like the Endangered Species Act or the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. More and more, you it's also not need, about surely, you need, you need to encourage people who live in countries where this may be the only way they have of feeding their family, uh, albeit an illegal way of, of going out poaching, selling it to people who would give them a bigger price for it. You need to be able to encourage the authorities in those countries to, to give them jobs. And in poor countries, that's um, not always easy. Absolutely. The to save wildlife, we have to save the humans who live with the wildlife. A report also came out showing that it, the animals and plants that are endangered, 80% of endangered species overlap with the habitat that indigenous people have been protecting. And so it's about supporting the human communities and supporting the plants and animals. And it's really about political will. Extinction is a political choice. So we can make the choice to fund and save these habitats and, and the people as well. But it's also about money, isn't it? So let's go around the table on, on this one, Helena. Um, in the United States, they've identified countless species that they said were endangered. They've been relatively successful once they've been put on an endangered list. In other countries, it's not as simple as that because they don't have the cash, the wherewithal, or necessarily the political will to do this. How do you change that? Well, I think, you know, that is spot on what is also the problem in, in Africa and many African countries is the lack of political will to save these species. Um, and ultimately, you know, we have to hold our politicians accountable when they make laws, they have to stick to them. And when they actually change laws, um, we have to uh, stand up, we have to engage, we have to stay on top of it. Um, Recently in South Africa, in fact, our, um, about 33 wildlife species became delisted and became um, uh, what they now call um, livestock. And uh, you can actually breed these animals. And this happened without any public participation. Um, and only now people are sitting up and going, we should have probably spoken up more when that happened. Because now lions, um, I think it's cheetah as well, can now be bred as if they are livestock. And this has actually no conservation value because these animals don't get put back into the wild to contribute to that gene pool. So, we so really sorry, if they're bred as livestock, are they, are they hunted or are they sold on? And if they're hunted, some would argue that that brings money back into the economy, which pays for environmental protection. Which is it? Well, that... <laughs> that is a real can of worms you're opening now if we if we bring hunting into the conversation and whether that is a conservation tool. Um, the idea is that, yes, that would be for hunting stock, um, also for auctions. Um, but yeah, the, that's, this is a big debate, um, whether hunting contributes to conservation or not. Uh, personally, I don't believe it does, um, but that is, that is a multi-layered, multi-faceted uh, discussion yeah which probably warrants its own program all on its own. Absolutely. Um, I mentioned the, the picture of the, the wild dog, uh, the plains dog behind you. And uh, Neil, that's a success story. But in your travels, in the work that you've done, and, and this would be for you as well, Tierra, where do you think there have been spectacular failures in saving animals? Uh, and, and why is that? So last year, um, in 2019, we lost the first mammal to go extinct because of climate change impacts alone. The Bramble K. Malomi is a small rodent off the coast of Australia went extinct because of rising sea levels. And so we can talk about habitat, we can plant the host plants of species, but if we don't get a handle on climate change, we're still going to lose a lot of species to extinction and maybe even ourselves. So I think failure to address climate change is our, our biggest extinction failure at this point. And what about people who say, yes, it's terrible that this sort of thing is happening, politicians, administrators, even environmentalists, I would suggest, uh, who are hand-wringing but actually not doing anything in particular, Tierra? It's terrible. I mean, in the United States, we've had really strong environmental laws, and our current administration has gutted a hundred of them, including the Endangered Species Act. This is the worst moment in history to be getting environmental laws. So we really need raised awareness and we need people demanding action 
to save wildlife and ultimately to save humanity. Uh, Neil, what can we learn from spectacular failures? An example that uh, shows you exactly what should not be done. Uh, well, I think uh, one of the most important things is, is to not uh, to, to not point fingers uh, at at certain uh, groups of individuals, groups of people. Um, there's there's a lot of talk at the moment about um, how how wildlife tourism, for example, is is very much a, a sort of a white European. Um, uh, pastime, but actually the the money that can come in from tourism to uh, to, to into um, remote economies, uh, uh, creating jobs, etc., is 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 important. But also, as we're seeing in Botswana at the moment, as a result of the lockdown um, uh, due to coronavirus, uh, without actually having the the eyes and ears on the ground from, from regards to to, to tourism, um, we're actually seeing poachers come in. Uh, to areas which are where there's, there's no nobody around uh, to, to look after these species, um, and uh, so so tourism has its role to play, um, and I think actually wh when we we look at we've mentioned political will quite a lot actually, and there are a number of uh, countries in Africa which are starting to um, to to take take their 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 own uh, lead as it were in terms of saying to Europe thank you very much for your for your for your involvement for for your ideas for your money but actually we'd, we'd like to uh, handle this ourselves uh, thank you very much and uh, actually we th this this is this is a, a matter that actually faces the entire planet we're all stakeholders in the solution um, and it's not something that individual countries uh, should be uh, just looking to do in isolation. Uh, yeah, so, so you need international will, and there is the CITES Convention, as, as was mentioned earlier on. There are other movements around the world to, to, to rein in poaching. When you have individual nations, as you suggest, wanting to do it on their own, what, what is their motivation, do you think? I think it can be pride. Um, and again, we've seen the, the, the shift in, in Botswana, for example, in, uh, for, from just the change of, of one president uh, to, to another and that, that the change in priorities. Um, but the conversations that have happened there with, with, with people here in this country, in the UK, uh, just saying thank you very much for, for all of your, uh, your advice. And, uh, uh, but actually, you know, we, we, we'd like to make our own decisions about how we, we manage our own land. And of course, that's, that's to be respected, of course. Um, but for example, and you'd think they would the know UK, the best way of doing this, but do, do they need well, um, instruction? Do they, do they need help from elsewhere? Well, this is the point that I was, I was going to make is that we here in the UK, we, this is one of the, the most nature depleted uh, uh, countries in the world. The biodiversity crisis in, in, in Great Britain is, is horrendous and it's, it's an embarrassment. Um, and on one hand, you could look at that and say, well, hang on, what right do you have to go around and tell other countries uh, how to manage your species and manage your land when look what you've done to your own uh, to, your, to your own species and to your own habitats. But actually, I think more importantly, we need to be a bit more grown up than that and say, OK, uh, we here in the United Kingdom actually uh, have made mistakes, put our hands up and say you can learn from the position that we are now in and learn from the mistakes that we have made to, to, to actually help other countries around the world uh, to not make those mistakes and, like I said, uh, share learnings, share advice um, and, and share that at the top level. Uh, at, at, so in, so in take conversation help the wherever it is offered as long as it is um, worthwhile help. I believe so. Um, hey, talking of help, I did say at the beginning, didn't I, that we would show a little bit of that pangolin uh, mm -hmm. film. Uh, this is one rather lacklustre uh, creature that's being well, he's trying to be reintroduced into the wild, but he's not having too good a time of it, perhaps, at the moment. He started slipping off branches and coming down to the ground to sleep. So Maya and the Ba'aka have brought him in for observation and some feeding up. So you're a bit concerned that he hasn't fully recovered his strength? Yeah, no, he hasn't. He hasn't, for sure. He used to be much stronger and much steadier and confident in going up the, the branches. They do fall, but he... He now fought like every day, a couple of mm. times. Everyone, everyone who comes into contact with him, everyone who works with Isn't him, it? somehow gets connected. Mm -hmm.
So there you have just just one example, lovely little film there. Uh, Helena, what happens if nothing changes? Well, we will lose pangolins for one, and then probably a lot of our iconic species, and then many, many that nobody has ever heard of, and nobody will even fully understand, you know, the role that they played in ecosystems. So that's why iconic species are useful, to get people to understand um, that they need to act, um, and that we have a serious, serious issue on our hands, and this is not something that is far away from all of us. Um, you know, just because you haven't seen that animal doesn't mean that the loss of its habitat and the loss of that animal won't affect you. You know, Tiara was spot on to say, you know, that climate change is one of the biggest issues uh, facing species, but it's going to affect every human on the planet. So we can no longer say these things are far away from us because, you know, we experienced it firsthand with the coronavirus crisis. You know, it, it completely brought to a halt the way we live. And it's an incredible opportunity for us to relook at our relationship with nature, the way we consume animals, the way, you know, the kind of products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not an issue or a crisis that's, you know, something that people in Africa um, or in other wild places face. This is... This is going to really affect every human on the planet. So, well, this, we this, really... is, this is one thing is, I mean, you, you may have the best intentions if you say to somebody in China, we don't want you to take the pangolin. You may call it traditional medicine. We may call it um, absolute nonsense. We, you may think they taste good, but actually what you're doing is destroying a species. So, Tierra, how do you go about persuading those who hitherto have been unimpressed by that sort of argument? Just the, the planet is small and everything is connected and we can't just blame other countries. The United States is responsible for a quarter of wildlife trade and every decision I make, every decision we all make about what to eat, how to get around, what to do on vacation, what to wear affects wildlife around the planet. So we all need to take individual responsibility and also push for policies to protect species. And it's not just whales and elephants anymore. We're talking about bats, butterflies, frogs, snails, the very fabric that sustains life on earth is now at risk because of the decisions that we're making individually and collectively. Neil, are, are we at risk as well? Because if this is the sixth great extinction, um, when you look at the previous ones, a large part of life on earth disappeared. Are, are we at risk? if we lose all these different species, are we as humans at risk as well? I believe so, and I do believe that uh, coronavirus is, is just a warning. Um, you know, the one thing we've not, we, we've only really just, just touched on here is actually the role that all these species play in a functioning ecosystem. And we are part of that and we, are, we rely on that uh, for our farming, to grow our food, but also to be able to have access to clean water, clean air. Um, these, all the species we're talking about and species you would never even he have heard of, species you'll never ever hear of. They, they all have a pl part to play in keeping us healthy, uh, mentally and physically, and in putting food in our plate. And I think if we don't uh, heed the warning that coronavirus is actually uh, sending us right now, then I think you're absolutely right. We, we do, I think there's potentially worse to come. Okay, let, let's end on a, a more cheerful note. You talk about uh, mental health, how they keep us happy mentally. Helena, I'm going to come back to you and we're going to run some more pictures of pangolins and you're going to tell us why you think they are so good for you and for other people. Because pangolins are um, an incredibly vulnerable animal. They um, can roll up into a ball which protects them against predators in um, nature. But this is exactly what makes them so easy to poach. You know, people can just come along and pick the cold pangolin up and carry it off. And ultimately, you know, um, once you've had your first view of a pangolin and you see this almost prehistoric fairy tale creature, you cannot help but fall in love with them and want to do everything you can to protect them. Because I think, you know, as a, as a keystone species, as an iconic species, you know, they, they deserve protection, but also I truly think it will say a lot about humanity and how we have failed animals and nature if the pangolin disappears. 
It's an animal that there is no reason for us to take them out of the wild. The medicinal purposes they could use for, there is no scientific backing for it. So this is something that can be stopped. And there is, there is no need to take them. Um, we have other protein sources that is sufficient. So it is an animal that deserves our absolute protection and our commitment because of what they stand for in our fight against you know, human wildlife trafficking, um, just the way we engage with nature, we, we need to rethink it and we need to do better for pangolins and for all other species on the planet. Listen, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Helena. Thank you, Tierra. And, and to you, Neil, as well. Thank you very much indeed. And good luck in your efforts to bring this uh, to international attention and to do your very best to, to try and protect some of our life on Earth. Uh, big aims, but wonderful ones. I'm sure most people would agree. I certainly do. Thank you very much for coming on Roundtable. Uh, and thank you for watching this program. For me, David Foster, we hope to have your company next time. Until then, goodbye.